Hello everybody, this is Dr. Ann Auburn and I'm the founder of the Natural Health Improvement Center. I'm here tonight to do a presentation on the art of hormone replacement therapy and it is an art. Uh, hopefully you'll get that by the end of our discussion tonight. Um, I'll be covering a lot of information so let's get started. So first of all, I'm wondering if any of you are having any of these problems. Maybe a little weight gain in your middle or other places. Is your sense of well-being slipping? Is it hard to focus? And how about loss of energy? You're probably thinking, you want me to exercise? And libido? What libido? <laughs> okay, well, we have answers for all those problems. You may also have some of these. The seven dwarfs of menopause or andropause. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. So if any of those are familiar to you, I think maybe you might benefit from hormones. There's a lot of other things we do here at the clinic that can help you with some of those symptoms as well. But hormone deficiency is a very, very common issue, especially when people are over 50. Um, it, we do treat patients that are younger, that um, have premature uh, menopause or andropause, which we are seeing more and more of that these days. But you also may be thinking, hmm, I'm not sure I want to do this, Dr. Auburn. I, I, uh, I've heard that this is something bad. You know, it might hurt me. It might be dangerous. It might cause heart attacks or blood clots or uh, might cause cancer. Oh, so if you've been kind of sucked into the fear mongering and you're thinking hormone replacement is dangerous, Let's just really look at that. Instead of listening to the media personnel that are just reading from a teleprompter with false information, let's replace the fear with science. So um, in my world, facts matter, and I'm always looking for facts to show that what we're doing is safe and effective and really helping people. That's what we really want to do. So first of all, let's look at what is a hormone. A hormone is a very specific message carrier. It's kind of like a key in a lock. Like the hormones are the keys, the lock is the receptors for the hormones on your cells, on every tissue in your body. So the key needs to fit in the lock well or it won't work to open the door. Let's say you have a rusty key, doesn't fit in there quite well or it's missing one of those little edges. It's not going to open that receptor, it's not going to sit in that receptor correctly, it's not going to open the door so the hormones can get in. So. Um, you know, these are really small molecules. Uh, insulin, on the other hand, is a larger molecule. Insulin, um, you know, is what we use for our pancreatic hormones. Our pancreatic, um, it's from our pancreas and helps us to um, open the cells so sugar can get in. That's a larger molecule. Hormones are much smaller. And the smaller the hormone, then the more exact the shape needs to be to preserve the message. In other words, to fit in the lock and open the door. So let's see. Let's talk a little bit about natural versus synthetic. We'll get a little bit more information on this later, but basically just think about this. When, when they create hormones for a drug company, that single, a single angle or a single chemical bond, anything just like hanging off the edges of that chemical molecule, it, it needs to be changed slightly, um, or it, it often is changed slightly just so that the drug companies can sell it as a drug. And just one little change like that will change the hormone message, and that's why quite often the chemicalized hormones are not as good. And we'll talk later about how progesterone is very foreign to the body and has some very negative side effects when it's in the chemical form, and we call those progestins. They go by names like norethendrone, uh, levonorgestrel, those things, they're, they're basically the progesterone that is in birth control pills, and we don't like those at all. They're not good for your vasculature, they cause inflammation, etc. So we don't like those. Conventional hormone replacement therapy, or HRT as we call it, it started in the 1970s and up to the 2000s. Uh, women and doctors were told by the American College of Ga uh, obstetrics and gynecology, as well as the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology, that conventional hormone replacement therapy was effective for preventing heart disease. So this is something they knew from prior research, 
And also, women were assured that conventional HRT would not increase their risk of cancer. Well, that's kind of partly true and partly not true now that we have more data. So, in 2002, the world was turned upside down when the Women's Health Initiative claimed that the use of synthetic hormone replacement therapy, Premarin and Provera, were supposedly associated with increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, strokes, and blood clots. So the trial was stopped abruptly, and this was because the invasive breast cancer statistic exceeded the boundary for acceptable. Now that's acceptable adverse effects. So they had their kind of numbers lined up with what they would feel is acceptable. When we, when we look at this, we'll see that those problems occurred no more often than chance. So that was the Women's Health Initiative study, and uh, the media news articles about hormone replacement therapy and adverse effects like breast cancer, strokes, etc., they were referring to the synthetic drug hormones, but specifically PremPro. See, there was two arms of this study. One was just synthetic estrogen. There were no problems in that arm. And then there was the PremPro arm, which is the synthetic estrogen plus progestins. That's that alien, very chemical molecule that causes inflammation in your arteries, and it does cause a heart disease and has been shown to cause cancer. So um, all of the negative side effects were in that arm with the PremPro. So we believe that the effects, any of them that were seen, were from the synthetic progestins. But still, when you look at the statistics, um, they really don't pan out to be a severely increased risk. So what you didn't hear, um, we'll look at these side effects here, or these um, health risks. Um, so in the PremPro arm, um, 7 in 10,000 women had heart attacks, 8 in 10,000 women had strokes, 8 in 10,000 women had pulmonary emboli, 8 in 10,000 women had invasive breast cancer. So that was like their limit and that's why they stopped the study. So what do these statistics really mean? It gets very confusing, uh, but this has been analyzed in just a few months after the information was leaked that was not true. It was really proven that um, this fear, fearful sort of um, side effects were really not as bad as they were made out to be. Um, see, even our kitty friend there is confused. So let me see if I can clear this up for you. I'm a cat person, so. Um, so the re real meaning of the WHI stats, they were extremely tiny increased risks, not even enough to consider remotely dangerous, because it really was no more risk than what you would have without uh, the HRT, the hormone replacement therapy. So again, remember, none of this occurred in the arm with the synthetic estrogen only. So that's important to remember. And, and statistics and studies, just a quick note here. When you look at statistics for medical research, unless the relative risk is increased 100% at least, it's really not statistically significant. And there really is no increased risk at all. That's just a little factoid about statistics. So um, it was a biased study, and this is why, specifically the South African cardiologist Jacques Rousseau, uh, he had a public bias against the HRT and was really out to prove that it was unsafe. And he publicly said he was going to put the brakes on the hormone bandwagon. So he was made the lead researcher for the WHI study, and personally I think that was a mistake because anytime you have somebody who's kind of that biased and they're looking for that negative result, they're going to call the negative result before, you know, it's possibly really there, if unless they're really applying their scientific, you know, hat. So, yeah, there kind of ended up being a little bit of academic dishonesty there because without consult consulting the other lead researchers, Russo leaked premature data from the study. And the media got a hold of that and stated that HRT was dangerous. It was going to cause heart attacks and strokes and blood clots and cancer. And unfortunately, this was completely and totally improper because there was no peer review of the scientific data at that point. It was very premature. Um, within a few months, the information he released was totally proven to be false. But unfortunately, it was already imprinted on the minds of women and 
physicians, everyone listened to the media that hormone replacement was bad. And millions of women were taken off their hormones, probably unnecessarily, and I'm sure it caused some um, harm in some people. So the damage was done. Only the scary headline news stayed in the consciousness of American women and physicians, and this led to you know, the abrupt uh, discontinuation of the hormones. And um, this misleading data is still professed by very intelligent, well-meaning expert physicians uh, from OB-GYNs to family practice to internists to cardiologists. And, um, you know, unfortunately, they are misinformed. They're telling their patients that hormones cause cancer, and that has totally been proven to not be true. So following up on the WHI research, within a few months when the data was scientifically reviewed, it showed benefits from HRT, even the worst possible version of chemicalized HRT. So even in that study, when they looked at the data, even though it was with synthetic hormones and the very scary, I would never write for <laughs> um, synthetic progesterone, um, it actually showed some benefits. And newer research shows that there are even more benefits when the HRT is bioidentical, and that is bioidentical meaning exactly the same as what your body produces. So in 2017, there was a study, Hormones, Heart, and Cancer, and this study was called Menopausal Hormone Therapy and Long-Term All-Cause and Cause-Specific Mortality, the Women's Health Initiative Randomized Trials. So the question in this study was, what is the relationship between the use of menopausal hormone therapy versus placebo for five to seven years? And then they looked at mortality over 18 years of follow-up. And what did this show? It showed hormones do not increase the risk of heart disease or cancer of any kind, let alone female-driven or hormone-driven cancers. So the conclusions exactly said, among postmenopausal women, hormone therapy with estrogen, that's the equine estrogen from pregnant mare urine, that's where we get um, Premarin, uh, pregnant mare, um, plus progesterone, the medroxyprogesterone acetate, for a median of 5.6 years, or with estrogen alone for a median of 7.2 years, was not associated with risk of all-cause cardiovascular or cancer mortality during a cumulative follow-up of 18 years. So this study has been repeated three times, and that really is the standard in scientific research. If you can repeat a conclusion, get this repeat research and get the same conclusion at least one more time, then you know you are finding something that is true and holds true in in further research. And uh, this was done three times over the last 20 years. Now, there are many researchers and authors that are challenging these WHI findings still to this day because still they're trying to break this myth that it causes cancer and heart disease and heart causes heart attacks. It actually protects your heart, and the earlier you can take it, the better. And this is um, covered quite well in Abram Blooming's book, Estrogen Matters, where he goes over all of the data from the WHI in great detail, and Lindsay Berkson. Um, Lindsay Berkson is an amazing uh, practitioner. She's a chiropractor, but she's also a scholar uh, for hormones. She studied at Tulane University with the men uh, who studied, or I'm sorry, founded estrogen receptors. And um, she's very intelligent, really knows how to read the research, and uh, she just can you know, discuss details upon details of scientific research, and she outlines a lot of this in her book, Safe Hormones, Smart Women. And uh, she is a great resource. Um, if you go to her website, drlindsayberkson.com, uh, there are her podcasts. You can also go to Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio for podcasts, and you can search through and find all of the hormone uh, interview she's done. The benefit of her information is it's not just her. She's interviewing lots and lots of people over the last three to five years and getting many, many experts to chime in on their viewpoint on hormones for both men and women. And um, so 
there's more studies. The French cohort study, um, since 1990, the French prospective cohort study has been following 98,995 French women. The study focuses on lifestyle, diet, hormones, environment, and treatments as major components of women's health. This study has shown that bioidentical HRT versus chemical HRT actually reduced the incidence of breast, breast cancer more. So that's good to know. We want to try and stay as bioidentical as possible. Also, there's Leon Spiroff, Dr. Leon Spiroff. He's a professor at University of Oregon, and uh, he objects to these WHI findings. And he was doing that right off the bat, like immediately after they were released in 2002. Dr. Spiroff spun off about 15 papers within two years of the study saying, don't listen to this data. It's flawed. It's methodologically flawed. There's things that were wrong with it. And the data that was just leaked early to the press was really not the true analysis. And um, basically, um, you know, one of the things that he promotes is that balanced hormones are the key. And also over 90% of the studies using balanced HRT show it is safe and improves quality of life. Um, and this is just the um, clinical textbook that basically almost every OBGYN uses to study for their board exams. He's very highly respected, and uh, he noted that there were problems with the study. But unfortunately, it's kind of crazy. I don't know why nobody listened to him. Um, I guess that just speaks to the strength of our big pharma and our media. Um, so we do have to think for ourselves, and that's why we do presentations like this, so that you can think for yourself, you can ask questions, um, and you can decide if you know hormones are something you want to do. So the flawed methodology, there was several things, but one of the biggest things they did is they forgot to control for the confounding variable of women who had already been on estrogen prior to participating in the study. See, there's a protective effect of estrogen shown in many studies that not only protects you at the time that you're taking it, but for many years later. So, you know, they weren't thinking about this at all. So what happened was the women in the control group, that's the like the placebo group, the group that didn't get hormones. But some of these people were on hormones before, and they had a lower incidence of breast cancer. These women that had had estrogen before they were in the control placebo group, and they had a lower incidence of breast cancer because they'd had the protective effect of estrogen before the start of the study. So what happened is when you have a control group that has that confounding variable, it made the experimental group look like it falsely had more cases of breast cancer. And that was just a huge methodological flaw. So that's, that's just one piece, um, very obvious. Um, also, uh, the North American Menopause Society and the Endocrine Society, they've come out and said the WHI got it wrong. Um, they support that HRT is beneficial for quality of life and women should be able to take it as long as they want. And, you know, they don't really talk too much about the protective effects, the cardiovascular protective effects, the cognitive brain uh, effects um, that are very um, protective, you know, from dementia and Alzheimer's, the anti-inflammatory effects, the, the effects on bones and all that. We have plenty of studies to show that. They just don't talk about that. They talk about quality of life. And that's important too. That's really why we're doing this, so that we can have the best life while we're here and live the longest, healthiest life we can. Not just live longer, but live healthier and happier. So um, if you want to help this fight for hormones, there's constantly this sort of barrage of, um, you know, powers that be, let's say. Um, I think you know who they are, the FDA, the big pharma, etc., cetera, um, that are trying to get rid of compounded hormones and almost compounded anything. Um, there was a bad compounding incident um, about 10 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more, where steroids that were being compounded, and they were really manufacturing. They weren't just doing individual prescriptions. They were making large manufactured uh, compounds and they were making some steroids, they were contaminated and some people got really sick and died from fungal infections. Um, unfortunately that was just like you know a ticket for the FDA and Big Pharma to start hunting down you know anything wrong with compounding pharmacies. Um, 
my compounding pharmacy friends have had to jump through so many hoops in the last few years um, to prove to the FDA that they are doing things right because of that one bad apple um, pharmacy uh, manufacturer. But if you want to help out, go to compounding.com. Um, it's just interesting to listen to a lot of the stories of you know women and men who have been helped by compounded hormones when nothing else helped them. And if you want to record your story, this uh, is shared by this group with um, Congress people so that they can make the right decision when it comes to saving our rights for compounded uh, hormones and other compounded items that are have been safe for years and now they're trying to say that they're you know not safe or they're difficult to compound or something like that. So, um, and call your senator, write your senator. Uh, compounding.com, I believe there's a link where you can just link on or click on the link and um, and we send these out all the time. If you missed our email, that um, is the email that you can just click on it and sign a letter that's already pre-made uh, for your uh, Congress people then let us know. We'll help you do that. So another interesting fact, pregnancy and natural hormones. For nine months of pregnancy, the body produces four times the normal levels of estrogens. We know that full-term pregnancy is associated with a lower incidence of breast cancer. Well, why is that? The increase in aggressive estrogens is overshadowed by an even more significant increase in protective estriol and progesterone. And we know from other studies, I'll show you some of those in a minute, that estriol and progesterone are cancer protective. And we try to give those as much as we can with um, our compounded um, prescriptions for our patients. Another very important fact is that 90% of the postmenopausal women who develop breast cancer have never taken any kind of HRT. They're never even on hormones. So, you know, all of these little red flags of information and the studies that show how safe they are, it makes me think, especially as an integrative physician, but also just a family practitioner, that there's something else going on. You know, it's not hormones that are causing cancer. I think it's lifestyle. I think it's uh, food choices. I think it's a lack of exercise and obesity. It's really gone crazy in this country. And there are physicians who lecture on this all the time, who do research that say, if you want to know your risk for cancer, look at the scale. Of course, there's other problems, you know, skinny people get cancer too, you know, so that's not the only reason, but um, there are chemicals out there. And that's why I recommend that we detox regularly, because if you don't detox, you are letting those chemicals just sit in your tissues and they're causing free radical damage and they're you know, causing mutations. So unfortunately, we live in an industrialized world where we must do something about it, or, you know, we're going to, you know, need, we're going to end up with diseases and cancer. So, you know, so much of this is in our control. We're here to be your coach for those things. <clears throat> and that's why I do a detox twice a year that I absolutely love. It's called the Ultra Clear Detox. There's two forms. The Ultra Clear Renew is a little bit stronger and takes out more things, including some heavy metals. And then there is the Ultra Clear Plus. Um, it comes in several different flavors. It's very easy. I've modified it so it only takes 21 days. It's like taking a protein drink every day and then changing your diet. There's a little booklet we give with it. And so, you know, if you're interested, please call our office. Anybody can do this. You don't need to be a patient of mine. You can call and just get the Ultra Clear Cleanse. Um, and you just can tell them if you want Ultra Clear Plus or Ultra Clear Renew. Or my favorite is the Ultra Clear Renew because it does a little bit more and it has a chai flavor, which is my favorite. <laughs> it actually tastes good. So um, I do it twice a year. All right. So hormone replacement and the cancer question. So we've got a couple of slides on this. Just for comparison, you really need to realize that the leading cause of death for postmenopausal women, and really is, this is true for men too, it's heart disease. It's not breast cancer, it's not prostate cancer, it's heart disease. That's our specialty here in America because of our diet and how we so easily come about, you know, getting carbohydrates and food and we just eat too much, we're spoiled. <laughs> so we got to put some discipline in and, you know, stop eating late at night and get better rest and, you know, balance our life. And we can teach you how to do that if you need some help with that. 
also, just keep in mind, 46,000 women die each year of breast cancer, but 400,000 die each year from heart disease. And pneumonia and influenza, they actually outrank breast cancer uh, as leading causes of death. And 1.5 million women will suffer the complications of osteoporosis. And some will die of that if they fall and break a hip and then they get into the hospital and they're sedentary and they're not breathing as well. They can get pneumonia and, you know, it's, it's not good. So we want to keep those bones healthy and the hormones do that for us. Uh, along with nutrition, diet, exercise, and supplements. So the risk of developing breast cancer from hormone replacement is less than the risk from postmenopausal deaths due to obesity and alcohol abuse. It's, it's amazing when you look at these statistics, it's so blown up and everybody's so scared of the C word, you know, now they're, they're operating on fear, you know, and we don't want to operate on fear, we want to operate on facts. So cardiovascular disease, let's look at that a little bit. Research shows that estradiol and the standard substitute replacement, Premarin, both have very positive effects on cardiovascular health and prevent heart attacks and strokes. And we're going to talk about this a little bit later for the guys too. This is for the men also, as well as the women. But specifically for estradiol, HDL cholesterol is increased. That's your good cholesterol. And your LDL bad cholesterol is decreased. And it also helps to just relax and dilate those blood vessel walls so you can reduce, also it reduces inflammation in your arteries and that improves blood flow to the heart, blood flow to every place in your body. And often if the blood pressure is high, it does decrease. I've seen it go down as much as 10 points with um, hormones. We have other things we use for that too, but um, the hormones are amazing in that way. Um, they also act as antioxidants. They, uh, the estrogen inhibits the oxidation of the bad LDL cholesterol and therefore reduces plaque buildup in the arteries. Testosterone and cardiovascular disease. So here we go, guys. And this is really for men and women. Women, you know, it's so, you know, that's one uh, thing I would say about Dr. Avram uh, Blumming is that he really focuses on estrogen, 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 but um, testosterone is so cardiovascular protective as well, and progesterone and estriol are, you know, anti-cancer. So, you know, even though he does a great job reviewing the Women's Health Initiative study and the flaws in that, and that we should be giving hormones to women, he kind of misses the boat on some of this other stuff. So I'll fill you in here. And, and Lindsay Berkson, if you do listen to her, she has just tons and tons of information about this. This is just like Tonight's lecture is in a nutshell, seriously. <laughs> you would think an hour we could cover a lot, and we are, but there's much, much, much more. So studies show that low testosterone in men is related to higher incidence of heart disease, and testosterone has been shown to improve the dilation of blood vessels and improve blood flow to all organs, not just the heart, also those you know, special organs that help us with um, sexual intercourse. So, you know, and everybody thinks, you know, testosterone is just for that. It's for so many other things. Testosterone is helpful for ligaments, connective tissue, mental focus, weight loss, fat burning. So it's not all about the erectile function or the libido, but it does help with that. So cardiovascular disease continued. There were a couple of animal studies in 1997. Monkeys were given estradiol. They had great benefits. They were given natural progesterone, and I emphasize natural, um, just like what you have in your body, bioidentical, and there was no loss of the good benefits. But when they gave the monkeys Provera, that's that synthetic alien to humans, chemicalized progesterone, it created severe arterial spasms and they had to give a special antidote to save the monkeys from an induced state of heart attack. So really this proves that Provera or synthetic progesterone cancels the protective effect of estradiol and it promotes constriction and spasm of coronary arteries. This is one reason why I just kind of cringe when I have to write a prescription for birth control pills. I know women love that, but there's so many other ways to, you know, reduce, um, you know, the chances of getting pregnant. You know, I try to talk to my young patients and get them not to do bioidentical hormones because they all have synthetic progesterone in them. But um, I understand sometimes, you know, they want to do it anyway, so we try to make them healthy in other ways. 
Um, also, you may have heard these uh, TV lawyer commercials about testosterone. Oh, if you've had a heart attack and you're on testosterone, you know, call us and you could be part of a class action suit. There was a study that was done in the VA um, on testosterone and heart attacks. It was a very poor quality study. It didn't have good controls. It was another biased study, and it was proven to be inaccurate. But unfortunately, the FDA still refers to this study despite its inaccuracy. And uh, I don't really have it here in this lecture, but there was another study done on um, veterans that it was 20,000. They weren't even on hormones, but they watched them over a couple of decades and they saw that the men that had a total testosterone level of at least 550 were much less likely to get a heart attack, to have a heart attack. I don't know what the percentages were, but it was statistically significant. And they weren't even on hormones. They were just looking at them to see what their hormone levels are. And later on, I have some more information that kind of correlates with that too in regard to prostate cancer and heart disease. Um, testosterone and chronic disease. So it's a proven fact that any person with a chronic disease does better with testosterone, and that's males and women. It's often the case that these chronic illness cases have low testosterone as well. So let's talk about testosterone and prostate cancer. Truth revealed here, there are no studies. None. Zero. Nada. No studies that prove any relationship between testosterone levels and prostate cancer. I saw a patient just today. He had prostate cancer. He was given radiation therapy for it. His radiation oncologist told him, no, 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 don't do testosterone ever again because it will undo everything I've done. And that's not true. The studies are exactly the opposite. And I'll talk to you. You can look up Abraham Morton Morgenthaler's studies. It's been tried to actually remove testosterone from males to prevent prostate cancer. And it makes no difference. In fact, I would say... You know, I have a few guys in my practice. We put them on testosterone. We check the PSA regularly at least once a year, usually twice a year initially. And I've found some prostate cancers early because if you already have prostate cancer there and it's already brewing, yes, testosterone can feed it. It is possible. When I see that PSA go up, prostate-specific antigen, that's the marker for prostate cancer, I immediately stop the hormones. That's the way I do it. Not everybody does, but then I send them to a urologist and then they sort out, is it safe for them to do testosterone? Should we go through the cancer treatment and then put them back on testosterone? But I've found several early prostate cancers just because I gave them testosterone and checked their PSA <laughs> and there it was. So Abraham Morgenthaler, MD, um, He's, the associate prof he's an associate professor of urology, and he's the head of the Urological Foundation, or he was at one time. He's gotten up and spoken um, and said this following quote, almost everything that we've learned about testosterone and prostate cancer is wrong. <laughs> so that's a pretty big statement. So what did he find out? So he reviewed the original study showing that testosterone promoted prostate cancer and believe it or not this study was only done with three men count them three that's ridiculous that's like a case report that's not even a study it's very inaccurate or it was very inaccurate and yes the researcher won a nobel prize for that but that was then and this is now we know much more information now and unfortunately when something like that hits you know either the media or it hits the medical kind of educational system. It just sticks for years and years and years. It's said that it takes on average for 17 years for anything to change in medicine. Even if it's crystal clear that it works and it's wonderful. And, you know, even if you've got two or three studies that show it's safe or whatever, um, it's just, that's the dogma of medical education and science. It just takes a long time for anything to change in medicine. So you have to kind of think with that, you know, when you're looking at studies and you're looking at what you want to do to maintain your health. So Dr. Morgenthaler did some studies. His study showed that men on testosterone with prostate cancer actually did better than those not on testosterone. And his studies also showed that men who were taken off testosterone while they were being treated for prostate cancer, that's how I do it, they did better and had less recurrence if they were put back on the testosterone after their prostate cancer treatment was done. And I always get the blessing of the patient's urologist when I do this, um, just to, you know, 
cross all my T's and dot all my I's. You know, I want the blessing of the urologist to make sure that they're okay with the patient going back on testosterone. But if they're all in the all clear two, three years down the road, their PSAs are looking good. Yes, of course, we continue watching their PSAs and, you know, we counsel them on diet and things to prevent, you know, recurrence of cancer. We put them back on testosterone and, and they do really well and they're healthy in many other ways. So he also showed that, you know, PSA often does rise when you're early in the process of testosterone replacement, but it doesn't automatically mean prostate cancer. You know, that's just kind of a, you know, something that happens. Um, it can also happen because of benign prostate hypertrophy. I've seen men that had a PSA, normal is less than four, when you still have normal prostate. And I've seen men with ranges somewhere between nine and 16 and sent them to the urologist over and over and over again and finally gotten a call from the urologist and they just said, hey, you know, he's, this guy has a huge prostate. Um, and it's funny, some of those guys don't even have symptoms of the urinary frequency or anything like that. Their body's just gotten used to it. Um, but that can make your PSA rise. Also getting your PSA done after you've had sexual intercourse, like within 24 hours or even with masturbation, it can make your PSA rise. Or if you have a urinary tract infection or you have prostatitis. So these are all things to consider when a patient has a high PSA. I always recheck it. Um, but in the meantime, I, I usually stop the uh, testosterone, make sure they're all in the clear before we restart it again. Um, so you can listen to a really great interview of Dr. Morgan Toller, my friend, Dr. Lindsay Berkson, um, episode 227. She interviewed Dr. Morgan Toller and it's testosterone mythology debunked by Dr. Abraham Morgan Toller. So if you want to go see that and, and you just will fall in love with Lindsay Berkson's interviews, I know I'm a great follower. She also has a, a group. If you want to become a member of her group, she has other perks but she's just done a great service to integrative medicine and the patients. Now, men and hormones, there were two big studies that I thought I should let you know about. One study was out of the University of Texas Med School, and it was 47,000 men. That's a huge group. The other one was out of Europe, uh, 83,000 men, and both had the exact same conclusions. They both showed that men who take testosterone, HRT, or those who don't but have strong testosterone levels on their own naturally had a reduced risk of cardiovascular events. So, and this is compared to and over men who are not on hormone replacement therapy or who just naturally have low testosterone levels. And by the way, we are seeing lower and lower levels in younger and younger people. And I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's something like Hormone levels in both men and women are going down 30 years earlier than they used to. And I've seen that. I've seen men in their mid-20s that have a testosterone level of less than 200. It's just so crazy when you see that. So, you know, we have to you know, educate people on diet and stresses and things like that that are causing that. That's not normal, but that's what we're facing in today's stressful um, environment. So... Even men who, in this study who had, in these two studies, even men who had really brittle heart disease, they had a lower risk of cardiovascular events if they were on testosterone or had strong testosterone levels. So testosterone is cardioprotective. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So testosterone and blood sugar, this is another important thing that I, I often forget to you know tell my patients about this, um, but it lowers your blood sugar up to 20%. That is massive. So men who take testosterone replacement have less adult onset diabetes. And it would kind of um, make sense that probably when a woman has proper testosterone levels also, you know, that's going to help their blood sugars as well. Of course, we don't have as high of a uh, testosterone level as men do, but testosterone at our proper balance levels does do similar things for us. So Men who take testosterone replacement have less adult onset diabetes, or it's less worse, it's better controlled if they do get it, and uh, this leads to less cardiovascular disease and also to less dementia. In Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, he talks about uh, the form of Alzheimer's due to high blood sugar levels or a high sugar or high carbohydrate diet 
that is the most common cause of amyloid plaque formation in the brain leading to Alzheimer's. So uh, yes, if you take your testosterone, you're less likely to have that. And there's independent studies showing that less dementia and less Alzheimer's in men who are properly balanced with testosterone. So testosterone also, just to summarize, is proven to reduce the chance of prostate cancer, reduce the chance of recurrent prostate cancer, improve muscle tone and strength, improve endurance, support healthy bones, improve erectile function, and reduce pain. And I also already kind of mentioned the cognitive stuff, but also just mental focus. It just is great for mental focus. Um, and so many of my male patients who are on male hormone replacement, they're just happier. They're just, you know, they just feel better. They feel more motivated. Their mood is just better. So many of the wives um, that bring them into the clinic <laughs> are, you know, the ones that report back to us, you know, how much better they are doing. Um, but they do notice it as well. So now women in testosterone, the more recent studies show that testosterone in women decreases the risk of breast cancer. Um, there are, if you just go on the internet and you look this up, you will find a lot of studies. This is kind of newer information. Lindsay Berkson also talks about this. Um, not sure she talks about it in uh, her Safe Hormone Smart Women book, but um, in her podcast, I know she covers this. And testosterone is an extremely beneficial hormone uh, that women produce, and the testosterone levels start to decline at age 40, and it's you know, not just for men. We, we always look at this in women also. Now, there are a few women that they just can't tolerate that much testosterone or DHEA. Um, sometimes they get acne really easily or sometimes, it, you know, just if they have rosacea, maybe it makes that a little bit worse. So, you know, we have to kind of treat each patient individually. That's what we do here. That's what our expertise is, is individualizing the treatment. But by and large, women benefit greatly from from testosterone. So testosterone in women is important for energy, libido, mental clarity, healthy bones. It contributes to bones too, although our progesterone does more for the bones than any other hormone, building bones. But testosterone is definitely uh, good for bone maintenance, um, optimal sleep, weight management, and mood stabilization. And estrogen replacement reduces or eliminates hot flashes, night sweats. That's kind of how we all get started because we want to be more comfortable in our bodies. We don't want to feel like there's an oven in our chest, <laughs> which is what a hot flash feels like if you've ever had one. <laughs> I have. Um, but vaginal dryness, also joint pain, insomnia, moodiness, uh, painful intercourse because of vaginal dryness, all of that is better. Also, um, it helps the bladder. A lot of people don't realize your bladder is lined with the same exact mucous membranes as in your vagina and it also makes your pelvic floor stronger so um, you have less urinary incontinence i've actually seen urinary urinary incontinence in women in people in their 70s go away in a week or two on vaginal estrogen so it can be pretty remarkable so again, estrogen and testosterone replacement, um, replacing estrogen and testosterone, uh, dynamic duo here as we age decreases the risk of heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, anxiety, depression, obesity, dementia, Alzheimer's. Again, again, you're going to hear me saying the same things over and over again. Um, hormones are, really are amazing. Um, testosterone helps to build muscle and burn fat and you know I'm not saying like when you start hormones you're automatically gonna lose weight people kind of come here and they think oh it's my hormones that are causing me to be fat or gain weight yeah that's part of it but you also have to put the diet in and you have to put the exercise in you got to drink the water and you know there unfortunately is no magic pill or hormone or medication that instantly makes you lose weight there are some medications for insulin resistance that do help with that, but you got to put the work in too. You got to think about what you're putting here in the mouth, and you got to think about how you're timing your um, eating. And we do have some really great tricks for that that have helped a lot of our patients. Um, testosterone does help fat burning though, and muscle maintenance. And it's really, I didn't mention this on the other slide, but great for ligaments and all connective tissues. That includes ligaments, tendons, hair, nails. 
the discs in your back. So um, also, you know, healthy libido, energy, and mental focus. All of those are important for balanced health. So again, hormone balance is what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, getting there with biodemical hormone therapy can often eliminate or reduce the need to take medications for all these diseases we just talked about. Even dry eyes, insomnia, I've just seen it vanish. Now, again, it's not that way in everybody, but it's so common that, you know, it's definitely with as safe of it as it is, it's definitely worth trying. And people will save hundreds of dollars a year in prescription uh, and other treatment costs. So hormones are definitely, I, I hope I'm dispelling your fears so you know that it's something that you should look at. Bioidentical HRT facts, estrogen levels that we do achieve with bioidentical HRT are lower than the levels seen in ovulating or men menstruating women. So we're not giving you these huge amounts. You know, occasionally, yes, we give a little too much or a form that makes a person have a little bit of bleeding when they haven't had any in years. And, you know, we do have to do our due diligence, get an ultrasound, make sure there's nothing there. I've caught a couple of um, uterine cancers throughout the years, but um, you know, again, it's it's not it's kind of the exception. It doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, we have to make sure there's nothing dangerous there, and usually it's just an adjustment in the hormones. And women on estrogen therapy live longer with a lower incidence of cancers. It's just proven in the the data. Estrogen replacement can lower your risk of Alzheimer's by 50 to 75 percent. Now, it depends which study you're looking at, but that is huge. Even if it was only 25 percent, that is massive. Uh, and the evidence for testosterone really is showing the same. And estradiol dramatically decreases the risk of osteoporosis. The bottom line, the risk of using hormones poses a much lower health risk than the risk of not using hormones. So if you can do it, it's definitely something. Thing you should look at doing. So it really does come down to the quality of life question um, and a decision that you as a patient and the physician or healthcare provider make together. Um, you just basically need to know that you have a choice. You know, it's not like, oh no, you know, hormones are just bad and we should never do that. Or gosh, you know, Several of my family members had, you know, breast cancer, so I don't want to do that. Yeah, there are exceptions. We want to rule out certain things if that's the case, but you have a choice, and you should be able to consider that, do the proper testing, and make sure that you are making the decision that works for you and your best health and happiness and longevity. So now if you are worried about cancer, I'm just going to throw these slides up here. Um, so that you can see we have many things. We have been doing some work helping um, cancer patients with their immune system to help them fight cancer uh, over the last few years. Um, my brother had uh, metastatic bladder cancer and that was when I said, okay, game on. <laughs> I'm gonna help him with this. And to this day, you know, I think in part by what we've done in addition to what his oncologist did for him, he is looking to be cancer free. We do special testing to see if there are circulating tumor cells, which you cannot see on a CAT scan. Those are microscopic or tumor stem cells. We test for that as well. And these are some of the things that come up quite often, you know, in um, many programs, both men and women, DIM or I3C, which is our cruciferous extract, um, helps to metabolize estrogens. Caldebucrate helps to get rid of those xenoplastic, you know, chemical estrogens. Estrofocus is our product that has both one and two. And of course your B vitamins, B6, B12, um, the proper folic acid, L5-methylfolate, and a good multivitamin, multimineral that has these in it will help you with your methylation detox. Uh, purified omega-3s and green tea. We use the Pure Encapsulations Decaf Green Tea Extract. Those two things are amazing for down-regulating tumor-related genes, which we also test for. So, and the rest of my top 10, um, lifestyle, it's huge. 
you know, diet, avoid sugar, chemicalized and processed foods, eat in moderation. Hey, you know, once in a while I do have cake, all right? I'm not perfect, um, but it's okay if you do it in moderation. But it, as a daily thing, um, yeah, there's versions of it that are safe, that are, you know, low sugar. You know, I have my treats that I do, but we're trying to get people to eat whole, real food and exercise, quit smoking, quit putting chemicals in your body, detox regularly, like I said, with the ultra clear. Um, and curcumin and wormwood are two that I just see all the time come up on the cancer testing that we do that shows that they are cytotoxic, meaning they kill cancer cells. Um, also lycopene, CoQ10, melatonin, antioxidants, they're all quite anti-cancer and immune boosting as well. And you know, we just measure estrogen metabolism and um, methylation of our estrogen hormones in our patients to make sure that's going well. Um, even in the patients who currently have cancer, we want to maximize their ability to detoxify their hormones. We don't have a test like that for men. We do have a methylation uh, panel test we can do on men. Um, but in men, we mostly measure their PSA and their estradiol and avoid overtreatment. So those are some of the things we do um, and some of the little pearls for anti-cancer. Now, I wanted to say a little something about hormone blood labs. When you see your hormone labs and all your results look normal, um, I just want you to know that today's normal is not normal. Like I said, these hormone levels are going down 30 years earlier than they used to. So we go by um, the Anti-Aging Association um, and their parameters for what is normal, what was normal between the 1930s and the 1960s. <laughs> Those are the better levels. You know, my dad just passed away last December. He was 95. In his heyday in the 40s, uh, total testosterone normal levels were 1,000 to 2,000. And if you look at your labs, if you've ever had that testosterone done, um, guys, um, they're going to say it's like 230 to 530. It's just ridiculous. That is not normal. But you have to remember that normals, um, I'll go to my next slide here. Normal hormone blood labs that you see on the labs, those are based on population averages, and that's not based on healthy optimal levels. So take home message, go over your labs with your integrative, integrative medicine provider, make sure you're optimized. That's what we're going for, optimal, not just normal, because we want you to have the best chance possible to have hormone balance and, you know, offset any stress or, you know, other medications you're using. So um, male hormones will not cause cancer, as I said earlier. There's no studies that show that. If you have prostate cancer, usually best to stop them until we get the all clear. And um, the levels should be monitored regularly, as well as PSA. Um, and then we go from there. And, and, and I check hormones twice a year on my patients that are doing them full time because then I can stay on top of it. We kind of have to do that with testosterone because it's considered a um, controlled substance. So it's been abused in the past by athletes. Um, but testosterone decreases the risks of many diseases as we talked about earlier. So um, it's just not a thing. Cancer and testosterone is not a thing. And if people tell you that, I mean, yes, if you have cancer, prostate cancer, we have to be careful, um, but testosterone really isn't shown to cause cancer. Um, also, I wanted to share with you, there's a new Finnish article that showed that hormones need to be, I mean, new meaning in the last three, four years, show, showing that hormones really, for the benefit, really need to be taken lifelong, not short-term, um, to lower mortality by preventing heart attacks and strokes. And what it also shows is the earlier, the better. So if you can get those hormones in as soon after you go into andropause or menopause, um, you know, that's the best way to do it. Um, but you can take them as long as you want to maintain your health and well-being. There's no restrictions. I've had patients who died in their 90s, late 90s, that were still on hormones, and they were sharp as a tack right to the end. Again, natural versus synthetic. Let's just do a little clarification here. For women, you know, the 
the synthetic Primarin and Primpro are horse urine based chemicalized synthetic estrogens. That's your pregnant mare Primarin. And um, they also have additives, coatings, synthetic stuff. And this is the kicker is they can remain in the body for 13 weeks. Natural hormones, that's not the case. Potency of synthetic estrogen is 200 times what your natural progesterones are. So no wonder these aggressive estrogens um, that are staying in your body for a long time can be somewhat bad for you in some ways, although there are some benefits uh, as shown by the studies uh, since the WHI. But a lot of these also contain a much higher percentage of the more aggressive estrogens and it's kind of a one-size-fits-all. Now they do have um, estrogen patches. Those are bioidentical estradiol. They don't have the estriol in it. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so there are some commercially made preparations that are bioidentical if you must have your insurance pay for it. Um, natural bioidentical HRT, it replaces instead of substitutes with an unfamiliar chemical. It's out of the body in hours, not weeks. Its potency is the same or less than estrogens in ovulating women. It's customized for each individual person. That's why everybody gets their own individual consult, their own individual labs, their own individual analysis, and we figure out what works best for them. And we use physiologic doses. Um, we don't like super high doses. It's really not necessary. And all of the body's other hormones are evaluated and treated simultaneously, like DHEA, cortisol, thyroid, insulin, not just testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. And then we always talk about the diet, exercise, stress control, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all important parts of holistic care. So women make beta estradiol primarily. It's um, the synthetic estrogen is alpha estradiol, which is the much stronger one. Um, and this changes the message content and it's 30 times more powerful than the naturally occurring beta estradiol, so that may be some of the problems with it. Um, also, it did start with good intentions. You know, why would they do this? Horse, you know, pregnant horse urine hormones. They wanted to relieve hot flashes and night sweats for women. That's a great thing to do. Um, but what happened is later on, the pharmaceutical industry figured out how to synthesize estrogens from plants but naturally occurring substances can't be patented. They can't make money from it. So they had to alter it to make it unique, make it a molecule that could be patented. So to make a significant profit and corner the market, they had to patent their product and make it so nobody else could sell it for at least a few years until the patent wears out. So that's how it, it kind of became a little bit twisted. Um, and this is just to show that hormones in women fluctuate throughout their menstrual cycle. And they, you know, need to be individualized. You know, we do this for cycling women as well because they often do have low progesterone or, you know, maybe polycystic ovarian syndrome. We can help them by balancing their hormones a little bit better. Male bodies and hormones, they're fairly steady. <laughs> they don't have the ups and downs uh, that women have. Probably that's why we have things like, you know, moodiness around our period, um, you know, PMS, things like that. And, you know, that some of that's just normal. You know, it's kind of irritating to feel kind of yucky and have period cramps. But when it does reach extremes, it often does mean that, you know, there's something wrong. There's an imbalance in the hormones. So variations do occur with stress, chemical and toxin exposure, aging. Um, we also like to look at the thyroid and adrenal function, and that can affect overall hormone balance in men. Um, an example of this is I had a guy who was on methadone and he had chronic back pain, had an injury. He was on opiates and then they took him off that and put him on methadone and his hormones were terrible. I mean, he felt terrible. He was tired all the time. His sleep patterns were messed up. And when we put him on the testosterone, he was like a totally new person. His pain was better. He felt better. And just to, cook, to clear up another myth, um, sometimes people think that, you know, if you give testosterone, it's going to make a young, younger male, you know, that's under 40 or 45 infertile. 
It's absolutely not true. I know that for a fact because this guy fathered three other children while he was under my care doing testosterone. It was like, it was a miracle for him. <clears throat> so it is safe for um, men, young men. Estrogen, there's three types. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I will flash up these slides. Estrone, estrogen, that's what we call E1, the strongest, most aggressive estrogen. Normally it's like 10 to 20%. Premarin formula is more like 75 to 80% of this. Um, many other formulas, it's 100%. Um, so we try to not use this. I do use it sometimes in a formulation called Triest. And that's fine. You know, again, it's balance. What we mostly use, though, is estradiol combined with estriol quite often. It's, it's very active. It's moderately active compared to the estrone we call estradiol E2. It's great for bones, vascular structures, cognition, as we talked about earlier. In high doses, it can be associated with uterine cancer. But again, you know, all the studies on that are with synthetic hormones. But that's why we monitor it. We maintain adequate but not excess levels, and we balance it with all the other hormones for cancer protection. And then estriol, this really is the anti-cancer estrogen. It's the weakest, least active. It nourishes hair, skin, nails, mucosal membranes. Great for vaginal dryness and vaginal um, pain with intercourse. Um, and it really does reduce you know, urinary incontinence as well and helps the pelvic floor and the bladder stay healthy. Um, it doesn't really have much of that cardiovascular or bone productive activity. Human females make 60 to 80% of this naturally. So Prem Pro and Premarin, only 6 to 15% is estriol. So you're not getting that benefit. Um, there are studies, many articles. Um, I just listed them out here. JAMA 1977, Cancer Research 1973, Lancet 1980. They all show the anti-cancer effects of estriol. Unfortunately, there's no large-scale follow-up studies, of course, because no one wants to sponsor it because it costs millions to do these studies, and the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in studying something and spending millions on something that they can't patent. Again, I'll just flash these up here, um, natural effects of estrogens. We've talked about some of this kind of... Um, a little bit earlier, but the way that estrogens prevent um, bone loss is they prevent resorption of bone um, by reducing osteoclast activity. Those are the cells that break down um, your bones and uh, the bones then are less dense. Again, we talked about a lot of this earlier, helps insulin levels, helps you know, your HDL and LDL levels for your cholesterol and uh, helps the blood vessels relax and reduces blood pressure if it's necessary. And it helps with the vaginal mucosa, also the bladder mucosa. Um, it also um, just helps the whole pelvic floor stay strong. And I won't go into the premenopause effects. Those are there if you wanna take a screenshot. Um, deficiency, of course, hot flashes and night sweats, sleep disturbance, aches and pains in the joints and muscles, depression, moodiness, anxiety. Some people worse on the emotional stuff than others. Mental fogginess, forgetfulness, dry skin and eyes, just dry mucous membranes, um, vaginal atrophy, painful intercourse, uh, headaches and fatigue. Now, some people do get headaches with estrogen, so we have to be careful with that. And if a person is susceptible to that, we have to watch our doses. Um, excess estrogen, increased body fat, increased water retention, bloating, uh, interference with normal insulin release and blood sugar control, overgrowth of the endometrium. This can create frequent heavy periods or dysfunctional uterine bleeding if you're menopausal. Um, growth of breast tissue, breast tenderness, and fibrocystic changes are mostly what we see. So we watch for that. And you know, again, remember a lot of this is studying synthetic hormones that are given orally. So it can affect gallbladder um, due to liver stress when it's given orally. When you give it topically, it does not cause that problem at all. It doesn't increase the chance of blood clots at all, possible blood clots, and reduce vascular tone if you get too much. But that's with the oral version. Topical patches, creams, um, injections, they don't cause that. 
Um, of course, excess of anything is not good, so it can create that problem. Um, and anxiety and irritability and migraines. So again, balance. Progesterone, um, it stimulates the bone building cells of the bone called osteoblasts. That's why progesterone really is the bone building hormone. It prevents water retention. It's kind of like a natural diuretic. Um, it will help you use fat for energy at a cellular level. So a lot of times people do notice when they do progesterone that it does help them with you know fat burning. Now again, most of these hormones are a double-edged sword. If you get too much, sometimes you can get the opposite effect. So you'll see that in the next slide. Um, it's like a natural antidepressant. We call it the happy hormone. Uh, progesterone is just so calming. Um, people just love it for the most part. Some people need a lot higher levels than others. Again, we individualize it. Um, it restores regular sleep patterns. It's a precursor to corticosteroid production. So um, we do find sometimes that um, people who are super stressed and they're creating that fight or flight response all the time, uh, that produces cortisol and in the hormone production cascade, sometimes you're stealing progesterone, you're stealing pregnenolone precursors, you're stealing DHEA so you can just kind of get enough cortisol to keep your head above water. That leads to adrenal stress and adrenal fatigue. Um, so that's why we look at all the hormones. So, And in your pre-menopausal, there's you know, other things that help the uterus and implantation of the fertilized egg and whatnot. We won't go into that. Um, natural progesterone. There was a study in 1981, Johns Hopkins University, Journal of Epidemiology. They took a thousand women, followed them for 13 years. That's a pretty good study. And progesterone, they showed that progesterone exerts a strong protective effect against cancer. So the normal level progesterone group had, get this, a five-fold lower increase risk, a five-fold lower risk of developing breast cancer. And it had a tenfold lower risk of dying from any type of cancer compared to females with progesterone deficiency. So, you know, I always say to patients, like, if you do one hormone, <laughs> do progesterone. It's so amazing. It does so many wonderful things. Um, protects your bones. It's anti-cancer. You know, people sometimes think, oh, I'm preaching, you know, hormone balance all the time. Like, oh, I can't do progesterone without doing estrogen and testosterone. Well, that's not exactly true. Sometimes, you know, again, we're doing this individualized to the patient. So sometimes it is the right thing or it works better for that individual person to just do progesterone. But it's an amazing anti-cancer hormone. So signs of progesterone deficiency, if you look at this, it looks a lot like estrogen excess. So if you, you know, in this talk, if you want to scroll back on it, you'll see that progesterone deficiency is almost the same as estrogen excess. PMS, frequent periods, heavy periods, irregular periods, fibrous and cystic breasts, endometriosis, uterine fibroids, anxiety, irritability, water retention. Sometimes when you get a lot, you will have no periods. You won't ovulate. I mean, that's actually how um, birth control pills work. Um, or you might have infrequent periods. So that's your progesterone deficiency, progesterone excess, irregular bleeding, menstrual cycles, um, fatigue, a feeling of sedation. That's why when we give progesterone, most of the time we give it at night near bedtime uh, and we give it orally because you don't really get that sedation effect when you do it as a cream or an injection. I think I've had one person in the last 20 years that really did have the sedative effect when they did a cream. Um, but if you're getting too much, sometimes bloating, nausea, GI discomfort, um, if it's, it's usually has to be pretty high doses. Like we're talking over 200 milligrams usually. Um, but some people don't have that even at 400 milligrams I've done in some cases. Um, I've never seen this, but I guess it is a possible side effect. Hyperpigmentation of skin when exposed to sunlight. I would say that's super rare. And then acne, I think that's because sometimes the progesterone is converted to testosterone or DHEA when you have an excess. Testosterone deficiency. Um, so the guys need to pay more attention here, but this is for the ladies as well. Decreased energy and stamina, muscle atrophy, just less 
muscle there. Uh, flabbiness, muscular weakness, decreased axillary and uh, pubic hair, or body hair in general, um, decreased sex drive and erectile function for men, boredom, disinterest, decreased self-esteem, lack of motivation, osteoporosis. So that's what that can look like. And um, DHEA, what does deficiency of that look like? Very similar to testosterone in, way, in, in you know, a lot of ways, but there's a couple special things about DHEA. It's secreted by the adrenal glands. So if you're in adrenal stress mode or have sunken down into adrenal fatigue, um, it's going to be lower because your body's going to steal that DHEA to try and make enough cortisol. Circulating levels are 20 times higher than any other hormone. It's a pretty important hormone. It declines with age starting in your 30s. Um, animal studies have shown that higher DHEA levels are associated with increased longevity and prevention of heart disease, cancer, obesity, and diabetes. That was done in mice. Um, but the human studies show that DHEA improves symptoms of autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, um, multiple sclerosis, lupus. It also helps osteoporosis and Alzheimer's. Um, and the effect is cumulative over time. Basically, kind of what they find is that the longer you take it, the less progression you get of those disease states. So it's a good long-term uh, thing to do, especially if you do have adrenal fatigue. So the deficiency symptoms, fatigue, decreased sex drive, decreased speed of healing, altered sleep patterns, very similar to some of the effects of testosterone deficiency. It's, they're both what we call androgens, so male hormones, so to speak, but they're important for men and women. Now, adrenal fatigue, I just wanted to touch on this with a couple slides. Lots of changes occur in your body. I have a whole lecture on adrenal fatigue and adrenal stress, but suffice it to say that it can really mess up your body chemistry, your sleep-wake cycle, your body rhythms, um, the immune system. It can mess up your blood sugars. Um, it can be hard on your cardiovascular system and uh, can give you heart racing, things like that. Um, so, you know, when you have a decrease in your adrenal hormones, DHEA and cortisol, that is, it causes other glands and systems to work harder. Like your thyroid's going to have to work harder. Your heart and nervous system is going to have to work harder to try and balance things out. Um, so you, your body will do the best it can to make up for this underfunctioning gland, but the price is fatigue, weight gain, hormonal imbalances, and you can have weight gain if it's too high or if it's too low. So some of those products out there that are just for cortisol, it's to lower your cortisol, and sometimes it's not appropriate. That's why we test, so we can figure out if you need something to raise your cortisol or something to lower it. And sometimes you need something to raise it in the morning and lower it at night. So um, let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of a cortisol saliva test, which is how we test for it. You can see in the morning that reading is very low. The two gray lines here indicate kind of normal. You kind of want to be high in that range in the morning and then have it slowly kind of go down throughout the day until you're, you know, time for bedtime so you can sleep and have a normal sleep pattern. Here you can see this person's kind of high in the normal range at night and they're low in the normal range in the morning, which is kind of opposite and it's kind of just flat throughout the day. So that's the kind of thing we look at when we test your adrenals. Um, how natural hormones are supplied, of course we write a prescription for these. There are some versions of it like pregnenolone and some lower doses of DHEA that we do give over the counter. Um, some, uh, there's different forms, you know, um, we never give estrogen or testosterone orally. There is one form of estrogen and testosterone I do give orally. They're called bioavailable lymphatic absorption tablets. We can only get them from one pharmacy called Belmar Pharmacy. I think they're out in Colorado. Um, they are safe. They really make a difference. You know, if we cannot get people's hormone levels stable with creams or gels or any other form, um, we often use this. Their technology shows that it kind of keeps it stable throughout the day. Um, but we also have creams, gels, injections, lozenges. We do implants of hormones for some people. I don't do implants generally as a rule for women who have a uterus because I've seen people bleed and bleed and bleed for months and months if they still have a uterus when you do implants. So 
I try to avoid that. Um, but that's also another nice way, especially for men love that too, because it's kind of like hands off. You put the testosterone in there, they're good for several months. They get it done two or three times a year and um, they're good to go. So, you know, a lot of people don't like to have that little cut placed and the pellets placed in there. It's a very tiny local surgical procedure we do here in the office, but it, it really is smooth delivery. It's very nice. Um, there's also sublingual drops. I don't use those too often. I use more sublingual lozenges. Um, there's suppositories. I don't use those too often. I have a couple of guys doing that. Um, uh, those can, suppositories can be done rectally or for women vaginally. And then there's the patches, the commercially made patches. And then there's, of course, oral um, regular progesterone too. But I'm not talking regular synthetic progesterone. I'm talking natural bioidentical progesterone. There's some that are commercially made, and then there's the compounded version that we get from a compounded pharmacy so we can specify the exact dose we want in that person. And just a word on thyroid. Um, boy, I know I'm running over here about 15 minutes, but um, you can always watch the, the rest of this later. We're almost done. Um, a thorough thyroid evaluation really does include all of these things here on this slide, not just a TSH. TSH is, hey, is the message leaving the brain and talking to the thyroid. What you really want to know is what are your free T3 circulating levels. That is the active thyroid hormone. So you want to check that and your storage form T4 and your reverse T3. That's a normal metabolite of T3 to make sure it's not plugging up those receptors and antibodies to the thyroid. Um, many, many cases have come to my office and they're just feeling terrible and their doctor tells them, hey, your TSH is normal. It's not that. And then I find out they have thyroid antibodies. And that is an autoimmune condition. And that makes it so your thyroid that you're producing isn't working that well. So um, we do it completely so we can really help them completely. And loss of energy is the most common symptom of hypothyroidism, but it can affect your period cramps, uh, make your periods heavier if you're menstruating. Um, it can cause constipation. Uh, muscle cramps and stiffness, uh, abnormal sensitivity to cold, uh, cold hands and feet, just a low temperature all the time. Um, it can cause weight gain in spite of you know eating a really good um, diet and exercising. Um, it can cause dry and brittle skin and hair and nails, um, hair loss, thinning of hair, hoarseness or a husky voice slowed heart rate and depression. And hyperthyroidism is basically the opposite. <laughs> we have a sheet we give to our patients when we treat them so that they know what to look for. You know, just in case they aren't tolerating what we're giving them, the most common thing is heart racing. And if that happens, you just know it immediately. I once was slightly overtreated and I could feel it. Within a half hour of taking my new dose, I was like, oh, okay, that's too much. Um, heat intolerance. Um, sometimes it's hard to separate when you have uh, when you're in menopause. Nervousness, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, breathlessness, increased bowel movements or diarrhea, fatigue. You can see some of these symptoms are similar to hypothyroid, but there's a definite di difference when you see a patient with hyperthyroidism. It can be subtle when it's just on the edge, but if it's true hyperthyroidism, their eyes are just mugged out. Um, you can just tell their heart rate's up, their blood pressure's usually up, they don't feel well, um, they have weight loss and they're not even trying. That rarely happens when we're treating people and we just over-treat them slightly. The most common thing would be a, you know, more hot flushes or you know, racing heart. So we educate our patients and you know, we just correct for that if that happens. Um, the thyroid is just like this butterfly-shaped gland in front of your windpipe. Um, the role is to produce the two key hormones, T4 and T3. T3 is the active thyroid that functions in every organ in your body. It's super important. And an underactive thyroid or a complete total removal of the thyroid because of some problem you had, or um, then you might have hypothyroidism. So just so you know what to look for. And as I said earlier, T3 is the most important hormone. 
Um, diet and hormones. So just again, I'm going to emphasize this, a low glycemic or a low sugar diet, a balanced diet, a whole food diet made of real food, that and exercise help you to produce and stabilize hormones. <laughs> so control your weight. It's important. Exercise every day. Eat a balanced diet. And if you're having trouble losing weight, let us know. We can help you. Um, exercise and hormones. I know that, you know, for me, it's like, yes, you know, another reason to exercise. <laughs> but I know sometimes that's the E word for some of you. I know you don't like to exercise, some of you. But, you know, I'm not talking, you know, P90X or boot camp. You know, we're talking, you know, taking a brisk walk every day, you know, going out for a walk or doing like a stationary bicycle five to 10 minutes twice a day. That can be just as helpful as doing some of this rigorous exercise. And you really don't want to over exercise if you have adrenal fatigue. Um, often that is a symptom of adrenal fatigue when you exercise in them for a day or two, you just feel terrible. Um, but exercise increases hormones and it stabilizes hormones. So um, I've seen it, especially in guys, it seems to be more common that hormone levels will go up sometimes 100, 200 points, you know, and this is proven in the research too, so exercise. I call exercise Dr. Auburn's magic pills. It improves your hormones a lot. It reduces your risk of diabetes by 50%, heart disease by 50%, colon cancer by 40%, breast cancer by 40%, and Alzheimer's by 50%. So exercise, it is good for you. <laughs> All right. So aging and muscle loss, just a note on that. Um, as we go through life, you know, as we age, we do have this thing called sarcopenia, which is the degenerative loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength with aging. Hormones are made to reverse at least some of that. And per a study in 2001 that was in JAMA, it was stated that sarcopenia is the backdrop against which the drama of disease is played out. A body that's already depleted of protein because of aging is less able to withstand the protein catabolism or breakdown that comes with an acute illness like COVID, like some other form of bronchitis, pneumonia, uh, you know, like, you know, any other disease state that knocks you down, um, or if you just have inadequate protein intake. So diet, exercise, and hormones help. So what we want is we want to be a um, healthy person who has good muscle mass. If you can see here on the left, there's the red here or the kind of uh, brick red here is muscle. It's much greater than in this other picture where we have an unhealthy person that has not much muscle mass. They have a lot more fat mass. Um, we call those people, hey, they look great. They look awesome. They may have still lost weight, but they've lost muscle mass too. So you want to diet appropriately so you don't lose that muscle mass. We call these people fat, skinny people. <laughs> and it's not healthy. You need that muscle mass to withstand, you know, um, you know, things that happen in life as you age and illness. So if you can't take hormones, we totally understand that. Hormones are not for everybody. I would say the vast majority of people do really, really well on hormones. There's rare instances where we wouldn't do hormones at all, um, you know, and, and really even in those instances, we're just more careful. But, you know, if you're fearful of hormones, if you just cannot get over that, despite all the facts I've given you today, we do have supplements that ease the discomfort of menopause or andropause. But what you have to know is that they're not going to help you with your bones, your heart, your vasculature, or your brain you're not going to get those benefits just by doing the supplements. You will ease your symptoms and that's good. Um, and you'll get some benefit, but it's just not the same as hormones. So these are some of the supplements we have at our clinic. It's not a exhaustive list, but a lot of these things are helping the menopause symptoms. Um, there's Cataplex F for females, Cataplex M for males. His synergy for males, her synergy for females. You know, there's over-the-counter DHEA, which is a hormone, um, but there's there's a lot we can do um, for men and women that don't want to take hormones. So, um, um, and that's really all I have for you tonight. I got some references. I'm just gonna flash them up here if you want to take a screenshot. 
or if you want to look up any of these um, because I didn't put all of the references for all of the things I said tonight, but these are some of the really good ones that I like. And um, we do have a copy of that JAMA study uh, that I referenced. It's not the whole study, but it's the abstract. So if you want a copy of that, we can give that to you. And if you just look up on PubMed, you can look up a lot of these things yourself. Um, but thank you very much for um, sticking it out through this 82 minute lecture. <laughs> It turned out to be a little bit longer than I thought, but hopefully you got lots of great information. And um, if we can help you in any other way, let us know. Feel free to um, call us at the Natural Health Improvement Center. 30, it's uh, 616 area code 3010808. And hopefully you know we can help you in some way. Of course, we can't give you advice if you're not a patient, but um, if you'd like a copy of this lecture PowerPoint, or if you would like you know, other, you know, references, look on our website, nhicwestmi.com. We have a ton of references and information there. Um, and we hope to do more in the f future on our social media and on our Instagram. But um, yeah, lots of information. Uh, and it's our goal to make people healthier and happier uh, as they live longer uh, or whatever their lifespan is, we want them to have um, good health throughout. So take care. We're going to end off here. And if you have any questions, let us know. Good night.